Keep yourself in the loop of everything football on the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. The latest news on and off the field, be it college football, Big Ten, SCC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, to the NFL. We've got you covered. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. This is the GSMC Football Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, you know who it is, Kayvon Izami, as always. I hope everyone's having a beautiful, lovely day. And you know how we always say, wherever you are, whatever time you're listening, whatever day it is, we appreciate you. For tuning in and enjoying the show, even if you're just catching a couple segments here or there, or even if you're the most loyal of the fans that are staying tuned for the whole podcast. No matter what, we appreciate that you guys are tuning in because it means a lot to us and the ratings have been excellent. We've been loving them. Um, They've been going up. This is a bit, hey, you know, I told you guys five episodes ago, big milestone episode number 10. Today is episode number 15, baby, the big one five. That's awesome, right? That's super, super exciting. I hope you guys have loved it just as much as I've loved doing them. And I hope that we can be here for many, many more. And I think that we will as long as I don't say anything stupid. Which I guess we never really know with me, right? No, of course not. I plan on being good as always. Um, So seriously, we do thank you and you know, everyone, the whole GSMC podcast network, go check it out. There, there's so it's not just sports. I mean, politics, finance, uh, even even a good sex podcast out there. I'm not even kidding. Like whatever you want to find, you can go on this podcast network and find it. All the great hosts out there, they they do an awesome job. I love tuning in whenever I have some free time. Um, so check that out. But make sure you always come back. To the one and only K. Bonnie Zombie and the GSMC Football Podcast. So we've got a great show in store today. We we really do. And you know what? You know what's really cool? We are three weeks away, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pumped up about this. We're three weeks away from the NFL football season. Three weeks away. That's mind blowing, right? It's so crazy. Like I don't know where wherever you guys are listening. Obviously, different places, the weather's different. Here in, here in North Carolina, it's hot. I mean, it is, it, it is hot, hot, hot. And um, whenever it's this hot, it doesn't feel like football season because usually once football season comes around, it starts to get cooler. Like, there's nothing better than waking up on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning during college and NFL season, and that fall feeling is there. Uh, obviously, we don't know what's going to happen with, with college, um, and, and usually the first month is always still hot, but then once you get into October, November, that's when you really get that cool breeze and, and, and that Sunday, Saturday morning of football feeling, the true football feeling. Um, but we're going to have NFL. We're doing it. I've been saying it for, since day one. The NFL is happening. There's some things they're trying to figure out right now with fans, no fans, couple places having fans, couple places not. We're going to dive into that in another podcast, not not in another episode, not today, but but it is interesting. It's something that we need to talk about if the NFL should think about doing a unified decision on this, because it's going to be weird if Jerry Jones down in Dallas, who we all know is going to try and do as many fans as possible, and that that's I'm not going at him for that. I mean, that's just what, you know, if, if the governors and, and the politicians in Dallas say that he can, then why not? He's going to do that. But it would be weird for a team to go there and then they come back home and there's no fans there, you know, or 25%. They, they should, it will be interesting to see if the NFL should 
make it a unified decision all across that if your representatives of your state allow you to have it, well, then you can have this amount of people and this amount of people only. But we'll get into that another time. We've got a lot to talk about today. We're staying strictly football today. Strictly football. We're not We're not going to talk about college. Uh, uh, we're not going to talk about COVID. We're talking about things that are happening on the football field, storylines going into the football season for different teams. But before we get into that, I do want to say one thing. I want to start the show with this um, because it's it's a story that, that really – shocked the football world and and it it shocked me as well and that was what we heard the other day about Ron Rivera being diagnosed with uh with cancer and it's a squamous cell carcinoma is is what he was diagnosed with and uh please forgive me if I pronounce that wrong my my girlfriend is in med school so I actually did give her a call up before this started like right before because I forget these things so quick and I was like hey how do I say this exactly so I can come on here and, and say it the right way? So she helped me out with that. So shout out to her. Um, but but it's squamous cell carcinoma, which is basically from from what I've been told by Emily, my, my girlfriend, is that and what I've read also, it, it's pretty much like a skin cancer. And, um, you know, R- Rivero told the team that he was diagnosed with it uh, this past Thursday night. And he said that he would continue to coach even as he's receiving treatment, which which can severely, you know, compromise his immune system and raise his risk of infection from COVID-19 because of the disease that's caused by the coronavirus. You know, we, we understand that, right? Um, but he's still going to go about coach uh, about coaching this season as of now. And uh, Rivera, he, he sought treatment after a self-care check and said the cancer was at an early stage and very treatable, which is, which is good news for sure. So I just first want to say this. Um, this sucks. It, it sucks. I hate this for Ron. I hate this for his family. Um, but before we even get into the p- football part of this, it's more important to say how awesome and great of a person Ron Rivera is. He he has always been known as a great husband, a great father, and that's the most important part of, about this, okay? Football is a side. Yes, he's a great football coach, but he's a great person. And that's what I think he wants to be defined as by most. Um by most, like most of the time. Now he's also known as a great football coach, a very good football coach, a a, a true leader. And most importantly, Ron is a fighter. He's always been a fighter and he's going to fight through this. And I have no doubts about that. And I know a lot of people have said, you know, take a break from football. It's, It's not as important right now. And that's true. Football is on the back burner compared to this. There's no doubt about that. But this is Ron Rivera. He's Riverboat Ron, baby. You know what that means, right? People in Carolina know what that means. He goes for it. He's a risk taker. And and he he clearly is doing the same thing here. He he loves his players. He respects his players. And he wants to be a part of the change that he's going to have for Washington. And and I respect that. Um, But I I just wanted to start out by saying, you know, my thoughts and prayers are with you and your family, Ron. Get yourself healthy. The entire football world is on your side. And you know that. Um. And also, real quick, Ron Rivera did say that if he does end up having to take a step away from Washington for a bit, bit, um, Ron Rivera hired Jack Del Rio over the offseason, which was such a great move um, because he will step in as head coach if that happens. And Jack Del Rio is perfectly qualified to do that. If I'm a Washington fan and Ron has to step away, that sucks. We don't want that to happen because that means the the cancer is is a little bit too much for him at at the time to be able to coach as well, which is totally understandable. That's a lot to go through. Um, But Jack Del Rio has 12 plus years of head coaching experience in the NFL. He is a really good coach and Washington would be good hands if that has to happen. Um, But overall thoughts and prayers to you, Ron, to your family and the football world and the sports world and the, all, all the world out there is, is thinking about you. There's no doubt about that. So I, I wanted to get that out of the way first. And now we've got a great show today for, for you guys, as always. We really do. Um, we're going to do a bunch of different topics here. So what we're going to do for the opening kick, the, the kickoff that we always like to think that we run back, and, and, I, and I think that um, we usually do, but we're going to start off with some coach talk, all right? Two coaches have been in the headlines this week about um, some decisions that they have made, and we're going to dive into that. We're going to talk about those coaches, 
and the decision that they've made and, and talk if they, they're doing the right thing or the wrong thing and, and what to think about this. And, and I will say this, both coaches are new coaches to their organization. One is a rookie coach and, and one is not a rookie coach, but he's in his first year with this new organization. And we'll dive into that in just a minute to start here. After that, going into quarter number two, we're going to have some rookie talk. That's right. The big three, three rookie QBs were drafted in the first round in the top six picks this year. Joe Burrow, Tua Tugavailoa, and um, Justin Herbert. We're going to talk which rookie QB is in the best position for short-term success and which rookie QB is in the best position for long-term success. It can be more than one. It can be one QB for both of them. Which QB is that going to be and why? With the, with the season only three weeks away, it's time to start looking at these rookie quarterbacks. You know, there's a lot on the line for them. So we're going to dive into that. Some very big names in that rookie quarterback class. Um, and then that will take us into halftime. Coming out of halftime, we're going to talk some running back, some Dalvin Cook. Dalvin Cook and the Minnesota Vikings are at an impasse right now in contract talks. The, the talks have stalled. What does that mean? Is Dalvin Cook going to sit out? Should he sit out? Does he deserve the big-time running back contract? What do you guys think? What do you guys think? Well, I'm going to tell you what I think. You know I'm going to tell you what I think. So we'll dive into that. And then to round out the show, we're going to keep the cave on times rolling. And I'll tell you what, guys. I mean, uh, it's all week. All week after that first segment that we dropped a couple days ago last Tuesday. Hopefully you've listened to it by now. But if not, go check it out. The Cave on Times is breaking headlines. It's breaking headlines. It's all over the world. It is all over the world. I never thought a newspaper could get started so fast in this day and age. But, I mean, we're, we're getting calls that they're sold out in, in grocery stores, sold out at newspaper stands in the cities. I mean, these things are just, they're, they're coming out in the press. We're stamping them with the hot, hot, hot takes, and they're just passing along. They're just passing along, and we have a feeling that this next batch is going to be the same way because we have some hot Cave On Times headlines coming your way in segment number four. So stay tuned for that. Now, let's dive into it. Quarter number one, let's catch the kickoff. Catch it right around the coming in, coming in, the 10-yard line here. Let's run it back. So, Joe Judge, the rookie QB coming over as the special teams coach with the New England Patriots for the last whatever so years, really like since Belichick's been there, it feels like. But no, I'm kidding. He, he's been there for a long, long time um, as the special teams coach. And now he's coming over and he is the head coach of the New York Giants. And um, this will be his first year as a head coach and, and the first year as a head coach in the NFL for a very, very popular team, for a very, very aggressive media market with the New York Giants. And this week he's made some headlines, as we you all have probably heard, that he has been making his coaches, his own coaches and players doing sprints during practice, it's been reported that he has been working his players pretty hard. And it becomes a question of, is this the right thing he's doing? Because he's clearly taking the Belichick model. This has been a conversation for a long time now. Belichick's coaches that are under him leave. They go become head coaches. And they try and do it the way Belichick does it. And it never works out. It barely ever works out. Joe Judge needs to be authentic. He doesn't need to be Bill Belichick. He needs to be Joe Judge. Like you don't need a radio host to tell you guys this. You're smart enough to know this. It does not work if he is trying to be someone else. Yes, Joe Judge, you learned from Bill Belichick. You did. You can call him your mentor. Everybody has a mentor. In this radio business, I have a mentor. I grew up listening to a couple people in my area, and I reached out to them while I was in college trying to do this, 
And, and I've talked to them ever since, ever since. And I, and I, they give me tips. They tell me how to do things, but then I spin it into Kayvon's way because I have to be myself. The very first thing one of my mentors told me, because I have two of them, and I'll go ahead and shout them out. Adam Gold, over that's been here in Raleigh, 99.9 The Fan forever. And Jerry V, and that's been with 730 uh, The Game ESP in Charlotte forever. You know, Adam Gold told me from the very first moment, you have to find your niche. You have to do something that's different than everyone else because there's so many people in this that are doing it the same. Joe Judge has to be himself. He has to be him. Nobody else, just Joe Judge. He can take things that he learned from Bill Belichick. He can take the way Bill Belichick runs meetings or the way Bill Belichick calls plays. Sure, I mean, it can be stuff that's really big. But the way you do your day-to-day operations, the way you run practice, the way you treat your players... That has to be authentic. That has to be real. If you're trying to be someone else, these are grown men here. These aren't college players. They're going to catch on to that in a second. You're not going to be able to build a relationship with them. You're not going to be able to be yourself with them. And and it's going to be awkward and it's going to be weird and it's not going to fit. Brian Flores, in his first year, with, with the Miami Dolphins was the first coach that I've seen that come came under Bill Belichick that showed me he's doing it his own way. And he's only been there for one year, so there's still a lot of time to go, but I didn't hear anything last year about the way Brian Flores was running his practice and how it emulates the way Bill Belichick runs his. None of that. Matt Patricia over with Detroit, he is running his just like Belichick is. And look where that's gotten him. He's won nine games in two years. You cannot try and be Bill Belichick. You can't. Unless you win. And you win big and constantly. Bill Belichick is tough. He will call out grown men like it's nothing. He will cut players, really good players, I might add. Just because they didn't listen to him. Or they gave him attitude. But nobody can say anything about it because his philosophy has proven to work. He wins. He wins big. And he wins often. Josh McDaniels tried the same thing when he was the head coach of the Denver Broncos. Remember all those reports we kept getting about players not liking him the way he would talk to them? How did that end up? He's gone back and has been the offensive coordinator for Bill Belichick ever since. We have an issue right now with Matt Patricia, who's the head coach of the Detroit Lions. And the, and he's on the major hot seat this year, season, as I just said, because he's only won nine games in two years. And he had issues with players like their best defender in Darius Slay because they were butting heads and they ended up having to trade Darius Slay. You have to win. Belichick wins. He wins so much that if a player comes out and calls out Belichick, Everybody looks at that player like it's his problem because everyone else made it work under Bill Belichick. And if they didn't make it work, they got shipped out. We have seen Belichick under studies fail over and over again because of this. Joe Judge needs to put his own twist on it. He has to or it won't work. Look, the Giants already got rid of a Hall of Fame coach in Tom Coughlin because of this. And Coughlin was a winner there. He won two Super Bowls there. But in the last couple of years that he was there, they weren't winning at all. They weren't making the playoffs. And he was still trying to boss his players around. These are grown men. Remember, they're not college players. If you want to be a tough coach, that is fine. But in today's age, it's just different. It's not like it was 20, 30, 40 years ago when these football coaches would literally belittle these athletes left and right. They would scream in their faces, grab their jerseys. That doesn't fly anymore. And that's not what Joe Judge is doing over here. I'm not saying that at all. But that tough-nosed coach nonsense, 
it only works if you can consistently win on the field because then it becomes a you problem, not a coach problem. Joe Judge has no cachet as a head coach right now. So if he comes in here bossing people around and they don't win, well, that immediately is going to be seen as a Joe Judge problem, not as a player problem. So Joe Judge has to show he can consistently win while putting his own twist on things. That's the key to that. That's the key to make all of that work. You can't go about it any other way. You have to be authentic. You have to be yourself if you want to make it work. And I like the hire. I really do. Joe Judge reminds me, and I'm not saying that he's going to be as good as this guy, but he reminds me of John Harbaugh, a quiet special teams coach just like Harbaugh was. Nobody knew who he was when he got hired. He's been a great coach ever since. I think Joe Judge has a lot of potential if he makes it his way. Not Bill Belichick's way. His way. If he makes it Bill Belichick's way, he'll be out of there in two years. Max. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. We're going to take a quick break. and we, When we come back, we will dive into the second coach that has been in the news recently. And what is going on with him. And I think that this coach is going to have even more interest from our great listeners than the last coach. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after this. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back. Welcome back. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. You know who it is. I am your host, Kayvon Izami. Coming at you on a beautiful Saturday morning here in North Carolina. Hope everyone enjoys the show when they tune in. As I said earlier, we're officially three weeks away from the NFL season. It's going to be so weird watching football while having the NBA conference and and NBA Finals on, having the NHL Conference and Stanley Cup Finals on. You know, we'll, we'll have the, the baseball playoffs like we usually do. And did you guys see that um, the NFL came out recently and talked about how they're even thinking about doing a bubble for the playoffs, just like the MLB has recently come out to say. It, it's it's interesting that, play, that teams and, and leagues that are not doing a bubble full season are starting to think that because that's the right thing to do for the playoffs. You can't do it for the amount of teams during the regular season, but once it shrinks and it's just those seven teams from each conference, because it's seven now, you remember it's, it's always been six, but it's changed. So it's seven now, which is really exciting, by the way. I love that we have seven teams. And this is why I have had, I've had a lot of people um, say like, oh, this is ridiculous. This takes kind of like the whole intense feeling of football out if everyone can make it well first of all not everyone can make it it's still football it's still going to be really really hard to make it in the NFC or AFC conferences but it gives teams more of a chance if your team starts the season one and four two and five 
you know, you, you don't just pack your head down and, and, and mail it in. You still have a chance because you could legit go on a run and probably get that seventh wild card as a nine and seven or eight, eight and eight and eight team, which is possible if you go on a run. The Falcons last year, they started one and seven. They ended up finishing at six and two, going seven and nine. They would have been one game out of that seventh spot in the NFC. Now, I don't want teams making it at seven and nine unless it's just an odd year. The NFC is so good, they still wouldn't have made it, but they would have been closer. Those last couple games would have mean, uh, meant a little bit more because they're still in the picture instead of being out of it so early. So I, I love that aspect of it. And then the, the whole bubble thing, it's smart to do. It, it really is. But the smartest thing the NFL should do is what the Saints and Cowboys are starting to do and what I said on this show first, and that's do, do 32 different bubbles. Each team needs to bubble their team. They do. Buy a hotel, rent out a hotel, rent out five, six, seven, eight floors of a hotel. It's your t- it's your hotel, it's your bubble, it's your team. That's it. That's it. And, and players have to be smart. Players have to be smart. Coaches have to be smart. Owners, GMs, all everyone has to be smart if you want to make this a season. It, you, you just do. And they know that, we know that, and hopefully we'll get that. But I'll tell you what, we are going to get the start of the season. Are we going to get the end of the season? That That's up to, for debate, and that all depends on how things go throughout the year, how our country is throughout the year. Uh, you know, do, does things get better? Do they get worse? That that's, Those are things we'll find out. But the season's starting. We're going to have a week one. You can bet every dollar on that. So get your, get, get your popcorn ready for all you, you – People out there that love your teams, you know, get your jerseys ready, figure out who you're playing, dissect that team, watch the film, baby, get into it, have some fun, have some fun. All right, this is the GSMC Football Podcast, so we just talked about Joe Judge and and what he's been doing up there in New York and some of the headlines he's making, and it's just simple. You, you cannot do what Belichick's doing. You can't come from the Patriots and try and be Bill Belichick, because let me tell you guys and girls something. There's only one Bill Belichick, and there's only going to be one Bill Belichick, and that's the winningest Super Bowl coach in NFL history. That's the best coach in NFL history, okay? If you if it was as easy as working under him and then going and being as good as him, then we would have a lot of Bill Belichicks. We only have one. And there's been a lot of coaches that have tried to become head coaches after being under Bill Belichick's mentorship, if you want to call it. Joe Judge, I like you. I think you have a lot of potential. I think you have a good quarterback up there in Daniel Jones. Don't waste this by doing what Matt Patricia is doing in Detroit, by doing what Josh McDaniels tried to do in Denver. It's not going to work. Do what Brian Flores is doing. Be yourself. Be authentic. Relate with your players as Joe Judge would, not as Bill Belichick would. Now, I told you guys that we have a second game, a second team that we want to talk about. um, A second coach, that is. And we are going to get to that. We're actually going to move that to the beginning of segment number four, which is a great time to tease that. And that's when we're going to do the cave on times, the good old cave on times, the headlines that are sweeping the nation right now, just hot, hot headlines right off the press, all about the 2020 NFL season has, you know, just really been coming up with some creative ideas. We're going to do that right before we discuss the cave on times. So stay tuned for that because I wanted this whole segment to talk about, the young quarterbacks that we have here coming up in 2020, okay? So that's what we're going to move into right now. Which rookie QB is set up for the most early success and the long-term success? Because that's two, that is two different things, completely two different things, right? Two different topics we're talking about here. You can have early success in the NFL, But that doesn't mean that you're necessarily set up for long-term success. Does does that make sense? You know, you can have 
you can not have or vice versa. You know, you can not have early success. You can have a couple of down years, but then turn into having long term success. And a perfect example of that is Alex Smith. Alex Smith was drafted number one overall in the NFL by the San Francisco 49ers coming out of Utah, which trivia, trivia, who was his coach at Utah? Ding, 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 Urban Meyer, you got it. Um, he, he was drafted number one overall, and he looked like a bust. For his first couple years, he looked awful. Then he had John Harbaugh come in there as his coach. He, he went to a couple playoff games. He got to the NFC title game. And then Kaepernick took over his job. He got shipped over to Kansas City. He went to the playoffs almost every single year there with Andy Reid. I mean, that is a perfect example of someone that didn't have early success and then went on to have long-term success. That happens. And then it's also the same way. Someone that comes out of the gate just firing, looking really good, and then you know isn't able to keep that going for many years. And, and you could, for that, you could say RG3. And, and I know that's not very fair because that's had a lot of injuries and stuff, but he's been healthy and he hasn't been able to produce like he was when that first cup, those first couple years in Washington. And again, I understand it, it, it is fair to, to talk about injuries there, but he has been healthy and he just hasn't been able to be the person that he was in those first two years that we saw with Washington. So it's two completely different conversations here. Both are very interesting. So the QBs we're talking about here are the three first-round picks, right? You have Joe Burrow, who went number one overall to Cincinnati Bengals. You have Tua Tugavailoa, who went fifth overall to the Miami Dolphins. And then you have Justin Herbert, who went sixth overall to the Los Angeles Chargers. Now, other QBs were drafted, like Jalen Hurts, who had a fantastic college career. You, you have others like Jake Fromm and, and Jacob Eason. But we're going to focus on the three that were taken in the first round. The ones that are here to be the next CEO, the next star of their franchise. Because that, that's how they're looked at. When you're taking top six, top ten, or even just top 32 in the first round, you're, you're taken there to be the eventual CEO uh, of that organization. So while, you know, Jalen Hurts might have success and, and same with Jake Fromm, Jacob Eason, we're mainly going to focus on these three QBs right here, okay? So first I want to go through some stats that might suggest a couple of these QBs are against the odds of succeeding. Actually, you might say all three of them. So let's start with Tua. We all know Alabama's dominance as a football team, right? And we all know the success they have had and, and the success Nick Saban has had as head coach there. The one thing, though, is Nick Saban has not produced many NFL QBs. Actually, since 2008, when Nick Saban took over as head coach at Alabama, he has only had three QBs drafted in the NFL from 2008 to 2020. Three quarterbacks drafted from 2008 to 2020. They've won six titles during that span. Six titles. And he's only had three QBs drafted. Greg McElroy, who was drafted 208th overall by the New York Jets in 2011. Then A.J. McCarron, who was drafted 164th overall in 2014 by the Cincinnati Bengals. And then Tua who was drafted fifth overall by the Dolphins this year. So clearly this tells us that Alabama QBs have not had much success or actually really success in the NFL in a really long time. Now, this doesn't mean that Tua won't be successful or anything, but it's interesting to see those stats, right? Now let's take a step further and bring in Joe Burrow to the mix. Joe Burrow went to LSU, another SEC school who has had more QBs drafted in the recent years than Alabama has, but none have had success. Jamarcus Russell is the most famous one. As we all know, drafted number one overall by the Raiders in 2007, became the biggest bust in NFL history. In 2008, Matt Flynn was taken in the seventh round by the Packers, and he had a couple big games. You remember that seven, six touchdown game and then he went and signed with Sam, uh, Seattle, and then Seattle drafted Russell Wilson, and that was all over. 
Um, 2014, the Titans drafted Zach, Zach Mettenberg in the sixth round. He is out of the league now. And then 2018, Danny Etling uh, was drafted by the Patriots in the seventh round, and he recently was just waived by the Falcons, so he is looking for a job. So clearly, there's a trend here, right? Both of these schools have, ha have had lots of success on the football field in college, but have had very little to no success at the QB position in the NFL through the recent years. And then you have Justin Herbert, which went to Oregon, who went to Oregon. And Oregon has one of the worst histories when it comes to success at the QB position. Mariota is the most recent QB to come out of Oregon, and he has had some success in the league. There's no doubt about that. He's made the playoffs a couple years with the Titans, but I think everyone was expecting more from the number two overall pick in 2015. You know, he just got released by his team that drafted him, and now he's already on a new team with the, with the Las Vegas Raiders. Now let's look at QBs that made the playoffs in the NFL this year, okay? And you might be saying, well, where are you going with this, Kayvon? And just, just wait, you'll see. You have Carson Wentz, Aaron Rodgers, Drew Brees, Jimmy Garoppolo, Kirk Cousins, and Russell Wilson, all of the NFC. Those are the quarterbacks that made the playoffs this past season, the 2019-2020 NFL season in the NFC. In the AFC, you have Tom Brady, Lamar Jackson, Deshaun Watson, Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, and Ryan Tannehill. All of those QBs either went to a small football school or a basketball school besides Deshaun Watson and Ryan Tannehill. And you could say Tom Brady as well with Michigan. But really, over the last like 10 years, Michigan has had much more success in basketball than football. Um, if you look around the NFL, the successful QBs do not come from big, successful football schools often. They just don't. I don't know why. It's so weird, but it's a history that has shown us. You know, you have guys like Jimmy Garoppolo coming from Eastern Illinois. Carson Wentz coming from North Dakota. Drew Brees, basketball school in Purdue. Kirk Cousins, basketball school in Michigan State. Lamar Jackson, basketball school in Louisville. Patrick Mahomes, basketball school in Texas Tech. Josh Allen, Wyoming. So Joe Burrow, Tua Tagovailoa, and Justin Herbert will all be looking to change this history. The history of their schools not producing successful NFL quarterbacks. Because of those schools... They're, they're, they're big-time schools. They're, they're big-time football schools that have a lot of success on the field but have not had success at the quarterback position in the NFL. The question is, will they change that? Will they be the first ones from their schools in the recent years to change that history? Now let's break it up into the two different types of successes, short-term and long-term. When we are looking at short-term success here, who is going to have the best short-term success, in my opinion? I'm going to go with Tua. And this is why. Because I think that answer shocks a lot of people. Tua has NFL talent right now. Right now. He has accuracy. He has footwork. He has a very good head coach in Brian Flores. And he knows how to win. He showed us that at Alabama. Now, Tua doesn't have the roster talent that the Dolphins do, that let's say, uh, Tua doesn't have the roster talent with the Dolphins that let's say Justin Herbert has with the Chargers. But in my opinion, Tua is the most NFL ready. And he very well will have long-term success with the Dolphins as well. But I worry about injuries with Tua in the long run. That, that's that's the one thing about that. And that's what that's something that comes down to long-term success. So because of Tua's NFL readiness, he, you know, his accuracy, his footwork, all of that stuff is, is really right on par with how you need to be as an NFL quarterback. I think he has the best chance for short-term success. Now, for long-term success, which I think is the most important, I would go with Justin Herbert. And this is why. Herbert has the raw talent. And you say, well, Kayvon, what does that mean? 
Honestly, if you put Herbert, Tua, and Burrow all side by side next to each other, right, standing right there, and didn't know any of them, where you were an alien and you knew nothing about these guys, and you put them side by side just to look at them and then had them throw a couple balls and move around, you would look at Herbert and say, he is going to be the best player. He has the physical attributes. He has the athleticism. He can move in and outside the pocket. He is able to run for that first down here and there. He has that true QB stature that these NFL GMs freaking love to look at and these scouts love to look at when they're scouting. He has all the makings of an NFL quarterback. You look at him and you see an NFL quarterback, but his talent is raw. It's not put together yet. He needs some time and he needs coaching. Also, when you're talking about long-term success, you have to look at the franchise. While the, while the Chargers have not won Super Bowls or, or any type of success like that, they still have been very relevant for the last decade with Phillip Rivers. I mean, they've made the playoffs a numerous amount of times with him. That They've showed that they can make runs in the playoffs. They know how to build around a QB for a long period of time. They showed us that with Phillip Rivers. Yes, they didn't win any Super Bowls, but they showed us that. We have not seen the Dolphins or the Bengals be able to do that yet. Yes, the Bengals had some really good years with Andy Dalton, but that fizzled out pretty quick. So when you put together the the, the true talent that Herbert has, the athleticism that he has, the body he has shown us that he is able to be durable, the body is a big thing. Tua has not shown that. And then the organization he is going to, I believe Herbert will have the most long-term success out of the big three in the 2020 draft class. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't think they all can succeed. I actually think they all have a chance of being really good NFL QBs. I really do. But there are more concerning factors with Burrow and Tua. Burrow, while he had an amazing season, a legendary season last year at LSU, it was only one season. Burrow even said it himself recently. He said if it wasn't for last year, he doesn't know if he would even be have been drafted or have a job right now. So I need to see more from him. And while this Bengals team is talented, it really is. If you look at it, that they're talented. And, but, but no knock on any of them. I honestly think that LSU team last year might have been even more talented. They were stacked from top to bottom. Half that team is in the NFL now. So I need to see Burrow do it over more than just one year, two years, three years. And then with Tua, it's strictly the injury history that concerns me. That's it. Like I said, I think Tua has the most talent out of everyone in this class. Ready to go right now. But that injury history in college concerns me. Because what's going to happen in the NFL? Can his body hold up? Can he learn how to avoid taking hits like Russell Wilson has learned to do so well? He needs to be sitting at home watching Russell Wilson every single day. The way Russell Wilson slides. The way Russell Wilson goes away from contact. The way Russell Wilson dodges hits. That's what I need to see in Tua first. But again, I think all three of them can have good long-term success if their organizations are able to build around them, spend some money, and if they can all stay healthy. But if you're going to ask me to pick right now, I think Justin Herbert is the one that will have the most long-term success based on all the reasons that I told you guys just a bit ago. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Hope you're having an amazing day. We are now going into halftime. Going to take a quick break. And when we come back, it is time to talk some running back. Running back. Dalvin Cook. Is he going to be playing next year? We're going to see him in that purple and gold with the Vikings. Or is he going to sit out? until we can get that long-term deal like Ezekiel Elliott did. Stay tuned. We'll dive into it right after this.
check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. This is the GSMC Football Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Quarter number three, quarter number three, coming out of halftime with a massive lead. You know, as always, that's how we do it. I'm your boy, Kayvon Izami. You can hit me up on Twitter at Kayvon underscore sports. Hit up the company account at GSMC, GSMC underscore football. You know, sometimes when I go GSMC, like, really quick, whew, it's a little tongue twister there. Maybe that's just me, though. I hope everyone's having a good one. Um, we just talked about, you know, the three rookie quarterbacks that are coming into this season with the most eyes on. You know, like I said, we have Jalen Hurts, who actually really will have a lot of eyes on him because of the situation that he's going to. And that's mainly just, like I said, because of the situation that he's going to with him getting drafted in the second round by Philly, um, an organization that already has a CEO, already has a franchise QB in Carson Wentz. And that you, you guys know how I feel about Wentz. I think Wentz is a stud. I think Wentz is, gonna, is one of the best quarterbacks in the league when healthy. Um, but he's had a problem staying healthy. I have to be honest about that. And Doug Peterson likes to get very um he he doesn't like to be standstill. So he he likes to get very in, innovative with his with for lack of a better word, word with his offense, right? Like he likes to change things up. He's one of those coaches that will come out at halftime and, and they'll have a whole different scheme um because of what they saw on the field during the first half. So with them bringing in Jalen Hurts, Hurts is going to see a lot of playing time. I really think so. I think Hertz is gonna, they're gonna use packages for Hertz, which will be super, super cool and interesting to see. But I still didn't put him in that top three category because he's still not gonna be the, the starting quarterback, the franchise future. You know, Wentz is still the future of this team as of now. And even though Herbert and maybe even Tua might not start right away, they're still the future of the Chargers and the Dolphins. And and Burrow is for sure starting week one. And it really is unfortunate that Tua isn't going to start week one because, or excuse me, it is, it's really unfortunate that Herbert isn't going to start week, week one because the Chargers play at the Bengals week one. Man, how awesome would that be to have a Burrow-Herbert showdown week one in Cincinnati? Oh, I would love seeing that. I would absolutely love to see that. Um, but Tyrod's going to be the starting quarterback for the Chargers, and rightfully so. He's earned that. He's done a lot in this league. He's a leader. He's a mentor. And honestly, Tyrod might play the whole season. I think that if you stuck some truth serum in the Chargers brass, you know, in their head coach, in their GM, not their owner because their owner already is always wishing for different things. All owners are. They want to see their young guys, their stars get on the field right away. Um, but they're not very realistic always. We know that. Um, and sometimes it takes a head coach and a GM to, you know, just calm them down, which is hard, which is hard, especially when they're writing the checks. 
but but I think if you if you stuck some true ser- serum into the Chargers, they would say that their goal would be for Tyrod to play the whole year because that means that they're doing really well. Because again, we talked about this when we did our AFC West division uh, uh, cave on division tour and, and bro- broke it down. The Chargers are, have one of the most talented rosters in the league. There's not many te- rosters that have a number one ride, wide receiver in Keenan Allen uh, on the verge of being a number one wide receiver in Mike Williams, and then a number one tight end in Hunter Henry to go with a really good back in Austin Eckler. Like, they're not to go with a really good defensive line that has Joey Bosa and and Melvin Ingram and then one of the best safeties in the league in Derwin James. Like, they have a stacked roster. And Tyrod showed us that he can win with a stacked roster. So I think if it's their goal, if they were like, hey, if we could do it our way, and we all know in the NFL that doesn't always work because after a couple bad games, you know, the fans start the the the, the online, you know, because there might not be fans in the stands. So the online forums start blowing up and the, the, the noises get louder for their young, the rookie star QB to come in and save the day. We all know how that works, all right? That's business. That's the business side of the NFL. When you start having a losing season and and your season's going downhill, you're out of it. So what do you do to make the fans still interested? You give them hope by putting in someone that's going to be there for the future. So if Tyrod can get this team winning and keep this team around 500 or better throughout the year, which I think he fully can, then they would have Justin Herbert sit behind one of the best mentors in the in the NFL and let him learn, just like Patrick Mahomes did behind Alex Smith, and then come in next year and start to be that guy, that, that starting QB. But he, there's no doubt he's the future, you know? And then same with Tua. Now Tua's going to play, all right? Ryan Fitzpatrick, he, he's, a, he's a good QB. He's a great mentor as well, just like Tyrod. But he's not... First of all, Miami doesn't have the roster the Chargers have, and he he's just not going to win them enough games. Okay, like he he goes on those streaks where he can win two or three games and looks like the best dang QB in the league, and then he goes and throws six picks the next game. So eventually, Tua will play, and I, I hope so because I want to see him play. I really do, and, and I hope he can stay healthy. But with Burrow, it's he's starting right off the bat. And he has a lot of talent around him on offense. Now, the defense is going to be a big issue, and the offensive line is going to be atrocious. And that's what I worry about Joe Burrow. That offensive line is going to be a disaster. And we know one thing. If you don't have a good offensive line in the league, I don't care if your name is Tom Brady or if you're a rookie like Joe Burrow, you are going to struggle because there are too many good grown men running at you from the defensive end. So that that's going to be an issue for Joe Burrow. But I hope the best, and, and I'm excited to see how that goes. Um, but let, let's dive into segment number three here with Dalvin Cook. Uh, as we all know, you know, Dalvin Cook is going into, this, this coming year will be his last season on his rookie deal. Okay, Dalvin Cook was inter, was entered the league in 2007. He was, he was snagged by the Vikings in the second round, 41st pick overall to be exact. And he's going into that final year of his rookie contract. So then he can get that big deal that he's looking for. Well, a lot of these players and a lot of these teams, actually, they like to re-sign their players the year before. They, they want to do it as soon as possible so they don't have to worry about their player becoming a free agent or their player, you know, um, go, trying to go hold out and, and, and play with another team. They, they want to get the deal done as soon as possible for financial reasons, all of that stuff. And, and uh, Dalvin Cook wants a deal. And the Vikings are trying to come up with a deal. And they, so they've been negotiating all offseason. This has been a storyline. You know, a lot of people doing their fantasy drafts that, you know, that's that that's this time of year. It's worrisome to, are you going to take Dalvin Cook? You know, because is he going to sit out or not? And, and he's, he's a big time player. So the thing about Dalvin Cook is this. All right, we've recently just heard that they're now at an impasse with with contract talks. They're at a standstill. The the stop the talks have stopped because you know one side has gotten upset. Cook's side they don't like the deal that the Vikings are offering. Um, Cook entered the year in 2017, and he's really the first two years he have been derailed by injury. He's just been injured. He hasn't been able to stay healthy. You know, only he only got 74 rushing attempts in 2017, his rookie year. 
Um, then in 2018, he got 133 rushing attempts. And, and then last year, when he was finally able to stay healthy and put it together his first full season, he got 250 rushing attempts for, thir- for 1,135 yards and 13 touchdowns. He also caught 53 passes for 519 yards. I mean, those are stacked stats right there. To have half of 1,000 yards in catching and then over 1,000 yards rushing, that is really, really good. The only other running back that had as many rushing yards and, and more receiving yards is, is Christian McCaffrey. So he played at a high level. The challenge now becomes giving him a contract that's probably meshed with the rest of the market. And really, this is the problem with all running back contracts these days. But that's a bigger topic for a different day. And we actually hit had that conversation on this very podcast in one of our early episodes. And we can revisit that at some point. Um, but now the Vikings, they're willing to pay him a certain amount. We've heard that reported, right? They have already offered him a contract, but Cooks and his agent have turned that down. And now they have, they, they've come to a standstill spot within the contract talks. Um, maybe the Vikings will end up, end up pony up, ponying up and offering him more later. I personally think the Vikings want to see him put together one more great season. Show that he can stay healthy for back-to-back seasons in the NFL and then shell out the money. That's what I think is going through the Vikings' mindset. It will be interesting to see how it, how it plays out. Um, we saw this offseason, Derrick Henry finished his rookie contract and then, you know, that was his last year on the rookie deal. He got the franchise tag and then they got a long-term deal that done right before the deadline. Dalvin Cook, he may have to end up doing the same thing. The question becomes moving forward if the Vikings' attitude is, look, we've made our offer, it is what it is, and you either continue to play under the final year of your rookie deal or you take what we have on the table. Will he be inclined to hold himself out of games if they do that? So he doesn't get banged up. You know, running backs are always banged up. They're always banged up. And this is where we get into the realm of can you still play when you're banged up like that? It's a really tough decision for Cooks if that happens because the last thing you want to do is play hurt and then risk getting a a severe, severe injury. But also, if you don't play, that gives your backup, Alexander Madison, who the Vikings like a lot. We have heard this over and over. The Vikings really like Alexander Madison. It gives Madison the chance of showing his potential, and that could make the Vikings see that they don't need to play to pay Cooks the money that he wants. Now, in no way am I saying Madison is as good as Cooks or better than Cooks or he's not even near Cooks' level. And the Vikings know that too. But that's the thing with the running back position, guys. It's very easy. At least in the recent future, it has been very easy to plug and play different running backs depending on how good your offensive system is. Now, I know I just took a break when I said it's very easy, so I hope you guys heard that. I'm not saying that the running back position is very easy. Last thing I need is uh, former running backs or running backs right now listening and, and saying, is this kid crazy? We, should, we, we need to put him in some pads. That would not look very good. That would not go very well, and that would definitely end up with me in the hospital. I can, I can 100% tell you that, all right? Um, what I'm saying is, it's easy to plug and play different running backs depending on how good your offensive system is. So it's a dangerous game that Cooks might not want to play. And I don't mean not play on the field. Play as in, does he play? And, or does he sit out and give Madison the chance to prove how good he is? And I think Cooks knows that. I think Cooks understands that this guy behind him is good and that the Vikings clearly like him. And if Cook sits out and Madison rips off, you know, a a, a thousand yard season in a year when he's not there, that's not going to be good for my reputation. That's what Cooks is thinking, I'm sure. 
So Dalvin Cooks is in a much different position than some of these other running backs we've seen in the in this position over the years where they're looking to get paid. Where, you know, Le'Veon Bell and that situation in Pittsburgh, there was nobody else in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh at that moment. At the end, they drafted James Conner, but he Le'Veon was the guy. So he when he held out and, and whatever else, but he, he was the guy that they had on the team. They didn't have anyone else. Zeke Elliott, he got his big deal because the Falcons, I mean, excuse me, the Cowboys firsthand saw how bad they needed Zeke when he missed those six games due to suspension that one year. And the Cowboys had an awful season and Dak had a terrible season, the worst season he's had since he's entered the league. And that was like, wow, well, who else are we going to play? We have to sign this guy. So he goes out and gets a massive deal. That's not the situation we have here in Minnesota, and that hurts Dalvin Cooks, and I don't like to say that, but I do think it forces his hand a little bit to have to play because of the talent of the guy that's there next to him. So, you know, hopefully, in his way, he could just be happy to share carries this year and do things like that and not totally crush his body with 300-plus carries or something to where he can still be fresh and and have a career in his second contract and capitalize off that because he is grossly underpaid right now for the run for the class of running back. Like he is extremely underpaid. I mean, look around at the contracts of these running backs right now. You could argue he's better than Le'Veon Bell right now, who's making 13 million this upcoming season. Look at David Johnson, who is making 13 million This season as well. Cooks is definitely better than David Johnson. As we sit here right now. There is no doubt about that. So there's a class of guys in front of him. Where he's looking at and going. Dang. That's that's messed up. I'm better than them. And I'd like to get paid. But I'm not sure it's going to happen. Because on the reverse side of things. The Vikings are looking at those two running backs in David Johnson and Le'Veon Bell and saying, well, we sure as heck do not want to end up in that situation. I mean, David Johnson got the contract that tied the Cardinals' hands to the point where they weren't going to be able to get rid of him until finally this year the Texans were stupid enough to make a deal and somehow they got DeAndre Hopkins back for him in return, which is probably the worst trade in the history of the NFL. I mean, that, that they just really lucked out with that. But otherwise, they were going to be in a real tough position. And for Le'Veon Bell, I mean, the Jets wouldn't do that again. There's no chance they would do that deal again. The, the guy that did that deal got fired before the even season even started. Adam Gates, the head coach, didn't even want him in the first place. And I do think Bell will be much better this season. I think he had an off season. I think he played through some injuries. But still, Cooks is better than both of those guys. And I think both teams, Cardinals with Johnson, Jets with Bell, have remorse for that after the fact. And I think the Vikings don't want to be in that spot. That's the problem with this, guys. That's the challenge. When you look at what Melvin Gordon got when he finally reached the open market, you know, the the reality is your best chance to get big money as a running back is with the team that you already were playing for. It's hard to get big money on the open market for running backs. Le'Veon Bell was the first running back to really do that. But these other teams, because these other teams, they don't want to be that next team. They don't want to be that next team where everyone is using them as an example of what not to do. And it seems like with most of these running back contracts... Where you just, you, you just know 7, 8, 9, 10 months away from saying... I told you so. Don't do that deal. I told you so. So that's the challenge here. And and then with Alexander Madison Madison there, who had more yards per carry last season than Dalvin Cook, and I know that necessarily does not mean anything. It's not indicative of overall running back worth or anything like that, but it does show that he has potential. Madison has potential. And then this is the reality the running back position is in. The supply far outweighs the demand. That's reality, folks. There's only 32 NFL teams. 
but there are a lot of running backs. And running back is one of the position, one of those positions where you can come right in from college and perform right away in the NFL. So there's plenty of guys that can do that job. And what happens is we get caught up in the name. We get caught up in the fantasy numbers. We get caught up in the touchdowns. We get caught up in the numbers with a guy having 150 yards rushing and two touchdowns on a Sunday afternoon. And yeah, there's another guy on the roster that can probably do the same thing. And there's a guy out there available on the street who can do the same thing. Maybe not to that extent. Maybe he doesn't have the most star power. But he'll be able to put up some numbers. And I don't mean to take anything away from the skill set at all. Because the running back position is so hard to play and takes so much physicality. And you have to be a whole different type of person to be able to play that position. But this is just the truth. And the NFL is a business. And at the end of the day, you have to acknowledge that. And you have to just go with it. And that's what the Vikings seem to be doing in attaching a price to Cook, Cooks and saying either take it or leave it. I mean, let me, guys, let me ask you guys this. Because this is a really tricky situation that Cooks is in. If you're a running back and you're Dal- in Dalvin's Cooks situation, and we know you're, and you're getting to the point of your career where you're having a little wear and tear on your tires, you've gotten injured a couple times, but you're also getting close to that point where make it, you, you, you're finally about to make some real, real money, life-changing money, family-changing money, generational money. Would you, would you go all out? Like, hey, Minnesota, just give me the ball this year. I want 300 plus touches and let me have a ton of touches just like last year and let me show everyone I can be the rushing leader in the NFL. Let me show everyone I can catch the ball and really put the squeeze on somebody out there in free agency or Minnesota to where you have to pay me the big bucks. Or would you split the carries more with, you know, Alexander Madison this year? Just take a little wear off your tire. Give yourself a break and then try and get the best deal out there in free agency next year. Kind of like what Melvin Gordon did last year. Or you could even go to the point of sitting out like Le'Veon Bell did because he didn't want those touches that Pittsburgh kept giving him. What would you do? And look, Melvin Gordon definitely lost money. There's no doubt about that. And at the end of the day, he still could have got $16 million million on a two-year deal. And that's a lot of money. And that's a whole lot. But would you bet on yourself? We see this all the time in sports. Le'Veon Bell, he ended up kind of screwing himself because there was reports that Pittsburgh offered him $15 million a year, but for some reason, he thought that he could reset the market and get like 18, 19. So he lost money. He still ended up getting a lot of money and more than I thought he would get. But this is, the, this is what we see all the time in sports. Will you bet on yourself? I think it's different in the NFL though. Because of the violence and the physicality of the sport. Because you never know when your career can just end. I always say as much, grab as much guaranteed money as you can and as soon as you can. Because you just never know in the NFL. And there is always, always someone that is eventually going to be just as good, if not better than you. And with Dalvin Cook, who has had injury issues, it's even more of a risk. But, I mean, we have also recently seen it pay off if you bet on yourself. Derrick Henry did this this past year. He goes out, becomes a rushing champion of the league, and ends up getting a big deal. But even that deal took time. He still got slapped with the franchise tag, and it took all the way up until the last day of the deadline to get a long-term deal done. And see, the, the thing is, running backs are always getting paid for what they've done, for what they have already done. They are rarely getting paid for what they're going to do. Does that make sense? When have we ever seen that happen except for Jarek McKinnon? Jarek McKinnon is the one guy who somehow got paid by the 49ers for do for what they thought is about to happen. And yeah, he still hasn't even played one single game with the 49ers because he injured his knee in practice a week before the start of the 2018 season. And then they had to do it all over again with the ACL last year because it just didn't heal right. He's the one guy, when they paid him, I was like, what in the world are they doing? What has Jarrett McKinnon done? But he got paid anyways. Most of these guys get paid on the plateau or on the way down. 
But that, that's what Derrick Henry was able to do. And I think if I'm Dalvin Cook, I'm going to take the best offer I can get as long as it's not a complete low blow. I know that might sound cowardly to some of you, and, and these are beast confident football players that, that believe in themselves. I get all that. I really do. But this is a different situation. The Vikings are a stern organization. I don't see them shelling out a fat contract to a running back. And don't tell me they have done it before with Adrian Peterson because that is a completely different example. When they paid Adrian Peterson, he was not just the best running back in the league. He was the best player in the league. He was MVP worthy. Dalvin Cook has been really good, but for one season. He has been injured other than that. It's very hard to give someone $14 million a year after one good season. I think the Vikings want to see him do it again. And I honestly believe he will do it again. I really do. I think he's a really, really good running back. He fits today's type perfectly. He can run inside and outside. He can catch the ball. And the whole Vikings offense is based entirely on the play-action pass. So they need him. They really, really need him. But he's got to show it one more year, and I think that's what the Vikings want to see. But I don't think Dalvin wants to take that risk. So will they be able to come up with a deal? I don't know. Will Cook sit out? I don't know, but I don't think he will. I think he's going to go out there and prove himself. But I think that if the Vikings are offering him anywhere between 11 or $12 million, right in that Derrick Henry range, he should sign that right away and he shouldn't look at what McCaffrey and Zeke are making because those guys are making 16 and $15 million a year and that's just not going to happen. Focus on what you're seeing in, in Derrick Henry. All right, then the, after that, you get to Kenyon Drake and Melvin Gordon at $8 million a year. No, you, you, you're more than that. You deserve more than, those, than that, that money. Get yourself in that 11 and $12 million deal and sign it. Don't worry about the optics. Don't worry that you believe you're better than, than the ones that are getting paid higher than that. It doesn't matter. This is a tough position. Sign the guaranteed money as soon as you can. That's what I would do. And it will be very interesting to see what Cook and the Vikings end up doing from here. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. I am your host, Kayvon Izami. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, quarter number four, finishing out the game on the highest of high notes because the Kayvon Times is back, hot off the press. Grab your coffee and get ready to roll. We'll be right back after this. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Number four, throw up the four, throw up the four. You guys know how it is. Every single time on the show, we're going to start that segment like that. It might be real annoying for some of you guys listening in the car or with your headphones on, but it's football tradition, baby. It's football tradition. You got to throw up the quarter number four, quarter number four. Awesome. I hope we've been doing a great job. Hope you guys have loved it. Uh, I'm having a I'm having a blast over here. Episode number 15, GSMC Football Podcast. Your boy, your host, the one and only Kayvon Izami. 
taking you down all the way till, well, for me, till tip-off for the Lakers Blazers at 8.30. It's uh, 8 o'clock on a Saturday night right now here. I'm, I'm finishing this up right in time. Last 20-second podcast then our episode um, segment, actually. Then I'm going to head on over to my couch, grab a nice brewski, pop the feet up, Watch some good old basketball, baby, some good old basketball, because I love sports, and I know you guys do too, and that's why you're listening to the show. We just had a great segment about Dalvin Cook and where he stands in the running back position and and, and just where he stands overall with with trying to get a contract with these Vikings, okay? Because the Vikings are a very interesting organization. They do things old school. Mike Zimmer's an old school coach. You know, he he's learned from the Gary Kubiaks of the world. You know, he's learned from the Bill Parcells of the world. The tough defense, run the ball, that's how we're going to win games. Yeah, that that, that's how he is. That's how he does it. They do everything through the play action. They do not put the faith of their their lives, you know, it really is their lives because if they lose, they're out. But, you know, it's not that cutthroat, but it's the NFL. You know what I'm talking about. Um. They don't put the, that in, in the hands of Kirk Cousins. They It's all through the play action. If they don't have a good running back, that, that offense falls apart. And I know they like that Alexander Madison guy. I know. And, and I think I might be pronouncing his name wrong the whole time. I think it's Mattison, like M-A-T-T-I-S-O-N. I know that's how it spells, but um, uh, if, if I'm saying it wrong, forgive me. Um. So, so that that's how they put they they put it all through the run game, and when Kirk Cousins is on, like when he's when like when he's really on, it's because that play action pass is working. Just watch some of these Vikings game, okay? If Kirk, if Cook is in there, when that play action pass is on, that's when Kirk Cousins can sling that ball. If it if the, if it's predictable and they know these throws are coming, it's game over. And, and Mike Zimmer knows that. Everybody in the league knows that. That's why I think they want to get this deal done. But I also know that they're not going to pay $16, $15, 14000000 million a year for a, for a running back. They're just not going to do it unless Dalvin Cook does another prove it year. Unless he goes out there this year and puts up the exact same stats that he did this year or last year or better and doesn't get injured. But is Dalvin Cook willing to do that? Is he willing to do a one-year prove-it deal? Or, I mean, a, a, a really, you know, I mean, on that last rookie time, that last rookie deal, the last year of the rookie deal, is he willing to go on that one-year kill it and prove it, or is he going to sit out? Or is he just going to take minimal touches and then try and hit free agency? What What is Dalvin Cook going to do? That's going to be the interesting question because, it really is a different situation than some of these other, you know, the, the McCaffrey contract got done right away. It's definitely more towards the Derrick Henry side of things, but the Titans didn't have anyone that they like in that backfield, so they felt they had to, had to sign Derrick Henry. And they ended up getting it done. So what we're going to do now, as I promised, we are going to finish talking about one other NFL head coach that was in the news. And then from there, we will jump over to the Kayvon Times. And we've got some good ones. And I'm going to be honest with you guys, all right? Last week, those that I came out with, that that was all by me. You know, I I had the creative juices running. This week, I brought in some backup. I got got a content team. I got my boys. You know know the guys, the B-Rays, the Wills, the Will Bowers. I got them, and and they helped me with some of these. So definitely want to give a shout-out to them. I don't want to take credit for for some of these because these are really, really good. At least I think so, and I'm pretty sure you guys will. And I know they're really fun and quirky and corny, but that's what it's all about. It's newspaper headlines, baby, about the 2020 NFL season brought to you by the GSMC Football Podcast. All right, so let, let's look at this now real quick before we go into those Cave on Times headlines. First, we talked about Joe Judge and why he was in the in the news. And now I want to talk about Mike McCarthy here, all right? Mike McCarthy has been in the news this week uh, for saying that he is giving up play calling duties, offensive play calling duties to offensive coordinator Kellen Moore. Now, remember, okay, Mike McCarthy is an offensive head coach. 
He was hired by the Cowboys because of the offensive success he had with Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers. He won a Super Bowl there, okay, as a head coach in this decade. For those that don't know, Kellen Moore was the OC last year for the Cowboys. He used to be a longtime backup QB in the NFL, and then last year he moved into the offensive coordinator role under Jason Garrett. When Garrett got fired, Moore kept his job because Jerry Jones liked him. He wanted him to stay. And then when the Cowboys hired Mike McCarthy, um, McCarthy decided to keep him as the offensive coordinator. But we all believed that, at least I did, and I know many others did as too, and, and many you know real experts in this field, thought that Mike McCarthy would be calling the plays, though. I mean, he, he's the offensive guru. He's the reason why the Cowboys hired him. That, um, so when I heard this, not only was I shocked, but I think it's a terrible move. And I don't think it's a good move for many reasons. So McCarthy said this, and I quote, this is the best decision for the football team. Yeah, okay, I am not buying that $100 lie whatsoever. And let me tell you why. Mike McCarthy, Mr. McCarthy, haven't you done this before? Or, or am I confused right now? It must be Daisy. It's a Saturday, right? Oh, wait, no. You have done this before. Yeah, that's right. It was when you were in Green Bay. Remember that time in 2014 when the Green Bay Packers lost in the NFC Championship game to the Seahawks because they screwed up on special teams? And then Mike McCarthy came out the next season and said, I'm going to give up play calling duties to focus on the rest of the team, like these special teams, so that doesn't happen again. And then what happened? The offense got really boring. That offense got real generic. That offense went downhill real quick. And then McCarthy said, yeah, I'm taking the play calling duties back. And he said, I will never do that again. He legit said that. He said, I never will give up play calling duties again. And now here we are. See, there are so many reasons why this makes zero sense. First of all, when a coach gives you play calling duties, it's usually because when a coach gives up play calling duties, excuse me, it's usually because the team isn't doing so well and he wants to shake things up. He wants a new voice in there. Maybe it will save his job. For example, last season, the Atlanta Falcons got off to an awful start. Awful start. One and seven start, mainly because the defense was so bad. So Dan Quinn, head coach, decided to give up the play calling duties on the defensive end and the defense turned things around. They got way better and it actually kept his job. That's an example of how it can work. But that's because Dan Quinn had no choice. It was either get fired or do something about it. Well, McCarthy just got the dang job. You haven't even had your first season in Dallas yet. This is just a bad idea. See, my great listeners, coaches are unique. You have to be wired differently to be a head coach. I could never be one. Not in the NFL, not a professional league. They notice everything. They can't let things go. Week one is going to come, and Kellen Moore is going to call some play like X option spider roll 9000 Z plane to the right 400, some crazy thing like that. And Mike McCarthy, being the offensive minded coach that he is, is going to say, Why in the bleep is he calling that play right now? And then it will happen again and again. And again, and then eventually McCarthy is going to say he is taking the play calling duties back. And then that will bring up questions by the media to Kellen Moore, to McCarthy, to Dak Prescott, to Zeke. It's going to be like, did you not like McCarthy or Kellen Moore's play calling? What is he doing wrong? Are you more comfortable with McCarthy there? I mean, it's just questions that are not needing to be there because the team hasn't even started yet. They're not in a bad position yet. It's his first year. And all of this could have been avoided if Mike McCarthy just kept the play calling duties from the start like he was hired to hear. Didn't we hear all offseason after the Cowboys hired McCarthy about how McCarthy used that year when he was not employed last year to get better as a coach? I mean, I heard the he did an article. He He went on a podcast with Peter King, who does a fantastic job for the NFL. And he told Peter King that he used the entire year last year. He, he used his basement and literally created an analytical team to study film. And that he used he did that to grow as a more modern coach. He learned how to throw analytics into coaching. He learned how to become a how to make his offense different. 
how to add more wrinkles and schemes to the offense. So you do all of that to then give up the job that with the with the Cowboys with the Dallas Cowboys that you were hired to do. You were literally hired here because you did such an excellent job with Aaron Rodgers. And Jerry Jones wants you to do the same thing with Dak Prescott. This just feels weird. It feels like there's something going on with this. And, and I can't put my finger on it, but I don't understand it. And I think it's going to turn out bad. And mark my words, by week three at the latest, at the latest, it might even happen before that, McCarthy will keep will grab those play calling duties back. At the latest. Mark my words. This is the GSMC Football Podcast. We are heading down the stretch. Ten minutes to go. And it is time for the infamous. The segment that is sweeping the nation that everyone is talking about. Whether you go to a coffee shop or a restaurant or down the street to the gas station. You're going to hear the cave on times being mentioned. Because we've got some really good headlines of the 2020 season coming your way. So are you ready? Let's get started. The first headline coming out of the Cave On Times is the Saints go marching out of the playoffs. That's right. The Saints go marching out of the playoffs. Look, I told you guys when we did the Cave On Division Tour... This team has talent. It does across the board, top to to bottom. But I do not like the way they have ended the last three years. Drew Brees has gotten worse. His arm velocity, velocity has gone down. His arm strength has gone down. He is getting older. I know they brought in Jameis Winston, but I don't think he's the guy for this team, at least not right now, maybe in the future. I don't like the way that this offense is going, and I don't think the defense is good enough. While it is very good, it's good enough for this division to be able to hold it impact. If they kept Teddy Bridgewater, I would have changed that. Because I think Teddy Bridgewater is a legit QB that can keep this team winning because of the talent they have. Jameis is not there yet. He turns the ball over too much. And don't even tell me that Taysom Hill is the guy because I we've already been through that. And I don't have time for that, but I'll tell you why he's not another day. But he is not a franchise quarterback. He's not. The Saints go marching out of the playoffs. The division is really good. The NFC is really good. And if they make the playoffs, it's going to be because there's that seventh team this year. But I don't even see that happening. I think that Drew Brees, unfortunately, goes out on a bad note. I think that uh, the the time to win it was a couple years ago when they got robbed by the refs. And, and I just don't see the Saints entering the playoffs this 2020 year. Next one, now serving Don Julio over Matty Ice, baby. Julio Jones and Matty Ice. Look, this, this, this headline here is more about these two together. While I do think the Falcons will end up second in the NFC South behind the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and they will make the playoffs in my, in my predictions. This is more about the historic season that I see these two having, having. Look, Julio Jones has gone over 1,400 yards for six straight years and it would have been seven He was seven yards short last year. He went for 1,394 yards last year. Seven yards short. I remember the last game of the season against the Bucs. I was praying for it to go to overtime so we could get that one more catch and and, and go over. All right. Julio Jones and Matty have gone through, have had some really good seasons. The most they've had was when Julio put up 1,871 yards, 1,871 I think they beat that. I think Julio Jones gets close to that 2,000 mark season. I think them two together, Calvin Ridley's on the come up. He's going to take away some of that attention that Julio keeps getting on the double team. I think that these two have a really, really historic season this year. Next headline in the Kayvon Times, main course, Tyrod Taylor, and for dessert, Rainbow Herbert. Oh oh my gosh, that's too good. Too good. That's right. Look, I've told you guys. I've told you guys. I love Tyrod. I think he's a great player. I think he's a very good player. 
a great leader, the best they could. They couldn't ask for having a better QB there to really mentor Justin Herbert. The problem is he just can't get it over to the hump. And I think that they're going to try and ride out Tyrod as long as they can. And if he can get them to the point where in the where they're in the playoffs the whole time, then that dessert's going to sit on the side. That dessert's going to chill, and then it's going to come back next year, and it's going to be a good dessert because he's going to have a whole year of, of sitting and and, and, and just, just being there to learn, to soak up some of the things that he's learning from Tyrod. If not, though, that dessert's going to come in a little bit sooner than we thought. We might be a little bit too full of the main course. We might push it aside a little bit too early, and we're going to bring in that dessert, Herbert. That's all to tell by how Tyron plays and how the rest of this team plays. Next one, Kayvon Times, Country Road, take Mahomes. It's an automatic win. It's an automatic win. To be honest, if you're on, this this can be mean a lot of things. This this title, but I think it's an awesome title. The headline. And I look at it this way. If you need one person to win you a game, if you're on a country road and you need someone, call Mahomes. Because Mahomes is going to get it done. Mahomes is going to get it done. He proved it last year. It doesn't matter if they're out. It doesn't matter if they're down 10, 20, 15, 30, 24. He's going to come back and he's going to win. He is that good. The next one in the Cave on Times. It's the Galladay Inn Express. That's right. It's the Galladay Inn Express. That is too good. And it's talking about Kenny Galladay. Look, last year, Kenny Galladay led the league in touchdowns with 11. This will be now his fourth year coming out of Northern Illinois, his fourth year in the league. He played at Northern Illinois and North Dakota, by the way. He's gotten better each year. 2017, 477 yards, three touchdowns. 2018, 1,063 yards, 5 touchdowns. 2019, 1,190 yards and 11 touchdowns. He's gotten better in each and every category every single year. Last year, Matt Stafford was gone for half the year, and he still put up numbers. Kenny Galladay is going to emerge next season as one of the top five, five, you hear that? Wide receivers in the NFL. I just said it. And that NFL in wide receivers right now is stacked. And Kenny Galladay is going to make a name for himself this year while the Detroit Lions shock everyone and get really close to making the playoffs. Get really, really close and maybe even sneaking in to that sixth or seventh spot, depending on if Matt Patricia is a good coach or not. The Kenny Galladay Express is going to show you guys how it's done at the receiver position this year. And the last one to end the cave on times. Judge Judy pops, locks, and drops it. Judge Judy pops, locks, and drops it. This is all about the Cardinals. And the, I mean, excuse me, this is all about the Broncos and the hype around the Broncos. All right. Drew Locke finished the year 4 0 as, as the starting quarterback. So there, there's a lot of hype around him. I still need to see what happens. I still need to see more out of him. I'm not fully sold. But I do love Jerry Judy. I think he's just like Calvin Ridley. I think he's one of the best route runners we've seen in the NFL. I mean, in college coming into the NFL, he's going to get a lot of separation. He's going to get a lot of open looks up the middle to the outside. Can Drew Locke hit him? Can Drew Locke make sure that he's ready to go? He's ready to hit him on time. And can he rally this team in a tough division to a playoff spot in his second year. Look, I like the way they ended last year. I really do. I need to see more about Drew Locke. But that Judge Judy is going to be catching a lot of passes this year. And Drew Locke better be ready to throw him on the money. I hope you guys love the Cave on Times. I love it a lot. We're going to try and do some more, try and get as many teams as we can. As we come down the stretch, we're three weeks away, ladies and gentlemen, three weeks away. I hope everybody is enjoying their summer. I know it's tough with all this going on, but, you know, try and enjoy it as much as you can and get ready. Get your jerseys ready. Iron, pull the jerseys out, pull the jerseys out, iron them, do whatever you got to do. Get your mojo ready because we're three weeks away from the NFL being back and we're going to have some fantastic 
conversations once that NFL comes back. I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you so much for listening to the GSMC Football Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask you guys to please remember, as always, go subscribe to the show and write a nice review. We've gotten a lot of reviews lately, and we much, much, much appreciate it. It's really, really nice things that you guys are saying. It really means a lot. Also, if you can, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff. Thank you. Have a great night. We'll be back next week. If you're doing your fantasy draft, I have mine next week. We'll talk about it next show. Do that homework. Do that homework. You do not want to become last place. Go win your fantasy draft. Have a good one. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play.